December 2010, Tunisian street vendor Mohamed Boazizi set himself on fire in protest outside a government office in the little known town of Sidi Bozid. In a matter of days, his act of defiance set off a revolutionary movement that rippled across the Middle East and North Africa, toppling some long standing authoritarian regimes. While protesters demanded more freedoms, hopes for a more democratic region were dashed as the fall of dictatorships led to civil war, unrest, and further repression in most cases. But the legacy of the Arab Spring lives on. As these economies now battle the impact of COVID-19, rising in unemployment, poverty, and slow economic growth, Dispersed protests are erupting across the region, signaling a continuation of people's demands for both economic and political change. Good evening and welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. I'm Liz Brailsford, the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Our program this evening features Stephen Cook, Senior Fellow for Middle East and Africa Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He will be joined in conversation with Joanne Held Cummings, Adjunct Professor at Baylor University. We have a full schedule of upcoming programs, so remember to check out our website at dfwworld.org for newly scheduled events. The Council is incredibly grateful to all of its generous supporters. I'd like to remind everyone that you too can sponsor a program for as little as $500 or $1,000 and to get in touch with our Alana Buenrostro at 956 four six six one one four nine about sponsorship opportunities and moderating tonight's discussion is joanne held cummings as i mentioned joanne is an adjunct professor at baylor university and served many years as a career foreign service officer in the middle east north africa and east africa regions in the public and private sectors she has worked across uh, the area from Morocco to Pakistan. Joanne has held many roles from D, uh, Deputy Ch Chief of Mission to Refugee Coordinator and recently served as the Foreign Policy Advisor to the Counter, Counter ISIS Coalition based in Baghdad. Daughter of an FSO, Joanne was raised in Lebanon, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, and I look forward to a fascinating conversation. Joanne, it's really wonderful to have you back with us so soon. It's a pleasure. I hand it over to the two of you and thanks very much again. Thank you Thank so you. much, Liz. It is an absolute pleasure to um, be with the World Affairs Council and also to introduce Stephen Cook, who, as you said, is a senior fellow for Middle East and Africa Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, but he also directs the Council's International Affairs Fellowship for Tenured International Relations Scholars, which is a very important aspect of the work the Council does. He has written extensively on Arab and Turkish politics, as well as U.S. Middle East policy, including several books, and I will name them because they're very important. Uh, False Dawn, Protest, Democracy, and Violence in the New Middle East, The Struggle for Egypt from Nasser to Tahrir Square, and Ruling But Not Governing, the Military and Political Development in Egypt, Algeria, and Turkey. And his next work on the end of ambition, America's past, present, and future in the Middle East is coming out next year, 2022, from Oxford University Press. So be watching for that. In addition to his books, Stephen is a columnist for Foreign Policy Magazine, and he has published and written and spoken widely across the media. Before joining the Council on Foreign Relations, he was a fellow at the Brookings Institution and the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. His undergraduate studies were at Vassar College, and he gained an MA at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and an MA and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. 
He speaks Arabic and Turkish, which is very useful in developing his deep understanding of the region, and he reads French. I was in Egypt and Syria and Yemen during those countries' protests and government responses. Like you, out there in the listening world, I'm looking forward to Stephen's comments as we look back through a decade since Arab Spring protests captured the world's attention. I will integrate your questions into our conversation in order to capture as many areas of interest as our time allows. And with that, Stephen, I would like to turn it over to you. And uh, again, looking forward to what you have to say. Well, thank you so much, Joanne. And thank you to everybody who's called in this evening. Uh, it's evening my time, late afternoon your time. Uh, all the folks uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, just to get it out of the way, I am a uh, very serious New York Giants fan. So if you have to leave the webinar now, I understand. But um, you know, if you want to hear about the Arab world, you'll set that aside. Um, it's a, as, as I said, it's a, it's a tremendous pleasure uh, to be with you all. And there's been a lot of discussion about where the Arab world is 10 years after what is colloquially known as the Arab Spring, which in my book, False Dawn, I, I think I used that term once and prefer to use the term Arab uprisings. Uh, spring connotes um, uh, blooming flowers, my daughter's running in the grass, giggling, all renewal. And I, I think what we saw in the, in the Arab uprisings was um, a genuine demonstration of people power, but a, a failure to force a transition from one political system to another. There were no transitions from authoritarianism to democracy, with perhaps the exception of Tunisia, which has done better than many, the other countries that experienced uh, uprisings and leadership transition. But of course, Tunisia continues to have its own challenges, and by no means can we consider it a consolidated democracy. What we see in the region instead has been uh, the breakdown of states, state failure. We now have four, arguably, five countries that um, have, uh, have either failed or on the brink of failure, resurgent authoritarianism, and a rather significant counter-revolution. Um, if you look at socioeconomic dynamics in the, in the region, uh, by and large, people in the region and those big countries that had uprisings, Egypt, Libya, uh, Tunisia, which is a tiny country, but was big in terms of the story that it was, um, people are generally worse off than they were before, uh, before the uprisings. It is um, a, 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 a sad commentary um, that the forces of the counter-revolution were able to outmaneuver those who wanted change and have enforced uh, the new old order through primarily coercion and force. There are more people in jail in this part of the world than there had been before. There is a fiercer uh, authoritarianism. Let me just, before Joanne and I have a, have a conversation, let me just add a caveat to my analysis. When I talk about the failure of the Arab uprisings, I'm talking about the failure of that particular moment, uh, that moment from late 2010 through 2012. Uh, I think it's abundantly clear, um, like I said, with perhaps the exception of Tunisia, that these uprisings did not result in what people who participated in them had wanted to see. That does, that does not mean, though, that in this part of the world, democracy and change is impossible. That does not mean, though, that there isn't the possibility of another round of uprisings that will succeed. After all, if you look at the socioeconomic conditions in the Arab world prior to the uprisings and look at the socioeconomic conditions now, one could argue, one could argue, although I won't make that argument, but one could argue that the situation is actually worse and thus the region is primed for uh, yet another round. And of course, uh, there have been persistent protests in places like Lebanon, which has collapsed, in Iraq, which is in a perennial state of collapse, in Algeria, which is a, stuck, and of course, the Sudan, which has had somewhat uh, of a breakthrough. So the situation, what I want to emphasize here is that those uprisings that captivated our attention, that uh, 
encouraged my mom to watch Al Jazeera. Uh, the things that we were talking about in 2011 and 2012 in the, in, in the Middle East and what the hopes and dreams are, that moment passed. It was indeed a false dawn. That doesn't necessarily mean that it won't happen again. But right now, the, it doesn't look very good for those who want to live in more open, just societies. I'll stop there because what I'm really most interested in is the conversation with Joanne, who has her own uh, deep expertise in the region and who uh, promised that she would integrate your questions along with her own uh, over the course of this hour. So thank you very much. And I, I look forward to the conversation. So Joanne, have at me. By the way, you have Thank a you. much better background than me. You get a 10 on Room Raider. I get about a three. I really <laughs> like that one. Well, you know, th this is purely to hide everything behind We're going to have to remodel this closet out of the way so I can get a good wall hanging like that. I'm going to start out reading you a question uh, that Tarek posted because I find it very interesting. We, we do focus so much on sort of the 2010-2011 period coming out of Tunisia and, and that linked protest movement. But of course, there have been things before that, whether in Iran or in other places. So his question is, November 1988, Students invaded the capital streets, protesting the military government in place. As a result, elections were organized. In 1991, the Islamists won. Immediately, the military intervened and canceled the results. A 10-year civil war ensued, causing the deaths of approximately 200,000 people. Peace was reestablished in 1999. What is that country, site of the first failed Arab Spring? This is a quiz? It's Algeria, of course. Uh, it is, of course. It is, of course, Algeria. And I think Algeria is a, is, is a super interesting case because throughout the 2010, 2011, 2012 period, people kept saying, well, what about Algeria? I, Algeria actually did experience protests during that time. People said, well, they had been through their uprising, which resulted in civil war and uh, the imposition essentially of military rule. Uh, before coming out on the other end of it to yet uh, in which the regime, that is the political system, had not changed. It, you had had this period of 1988 through the dark decade of the 1990s where 100,000 or more Algerians at least were killed. And you came back to basically what was essentially the status quo. The pouvoir, the military establishment remained in control of the country. It was a a failed moment. Now, again, back to my point, that period, that long period did not bring the fundamental change that people had wanted. We can argue about what exactly that was, given the fact that, that, that the political change eventually was led by Islamists. But my point is, is that it did not bring the change that people had wanted. Yet, in another decade or so, you do have another protest movement that did was able to force an Algerian president from office. Of course, he was probably dead anyway, but the fact of the matter is, is that there did force change. Now, Algeria is essentially a stalemate. The movement, the protest movement continues, the government remains in control, but it's like a checkmate neither has the ability nor the power to impose their will on the other. And so what you have is a, a, a jockeying position for position and hoping for a change so that one could do that. That's a situation that could end up being like that for quite some time. Neither are willing, uh, neither are willing to give it up. And that's what I think one of the kind of my radical intellectual project in writing False Dawn was that not only was I in Egypt at the beginning of the uprising against Hosni Mubarak, which was an extraordinary moment, um, but I then returned to Washington. I, I wasn't there for the full 18 days, and I, I returned to Washington. And having been in and around Tahrir Square for, those, for the beginning of the uprising, I was struck by the conversation in Washington and how it, it, was, it, it didn't align with what I had experienced 
in Egypt. And there were a whole set of assumptions that people brought to the table in the debate and conversation about the Arab uprisings, particularly in Egypt, that there was going to be democracy at the end of this protest rainbow. And that the template that people were, 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 were putting on top of it, even though they said that they weren't, were other successful revolutions, the revolutions in Eastern and Central Europe in 1989. Uh, people were going back to, they were without recognizing the possibility that there were other outcomes and that those other mm -hmm. outcomes were narrower, fiercer dictatorships in the region. Which is surprising in a sense, given that we have seen that play out before. So it's, the- Right, that people, right, transitions to democracy fail more often than they succeed. Yet exactly. There was something about the, what was happening in the air, because it was so, for, for many people, it was so unexpected. Look, mm -hmm. I, 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 if anybody's out there has actually read False Dawn, one of the opening chapters describes a meeting that I was in with uh, a, a, a number of other academics and uh, officials from the US intelligence community. And it, the day long meeting was to discuss what were the, what was the dominant political trend in the Middle East for the foreseeable future. And the foreseeable future was defined three to five years. And by and large, there was agreement that the dominant political trend in the region was going to be stability. That meeting took place four days before Mohammed Bouazizi lit himself on fire. So I, I think it was, the point is, is that it was so surprising and that Zina Labadin Ben Ali fell in a month. Joanne mm -hmm. served in North Africa. That's not supposed to happen. He had <laughs> no. built a fearsome fearsome police state over the course of 27 years. Then Hosni Mubarak fell in 18 days. Egyptian leaders do not outlive their tenure. They're, that's why there are pyramids to their everlasting memory of their, their time. On This was totally unexpected. So there was this sense that the totally unexpected could happen in other places. In, in March of 2011, the assumption was that Bashar al-Assad would fall within days because the template had become Ben Ali and Mubarak. And here we are, we're still living with Bashar al-Assad and the, and, 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 and the horrific, horrific results of that. Because we couldn't imagine. What was unimaginable became what was happening and then we couldn't imagine the counter-revolution. And Syria was interesting because you know, I think that everyone, both in the region and in foreign capitals, was aware that there were tensions in Egypt and that there was opposition and that people were voicing it. And the same in Tunisia. In Syria, I think most people against Syrian and otherwise felt that there won't be any protests there because the government will not allow there to be protests. And initially, of course, you'd have four people going out in the street and they'd get arrested and tortured. Right. But they kept coming out. And the thing that I find most interesting in the case of Syria is that Syria doesn't have a history of civil wars. Sort of once it tipped that balance into civil war, everyone was like, we don't know how to get out of this. So how do you see... you? you in, in one of your books, when you talk about, you know, ruling and not governing, how does it play out in Syria if Bashar wins the war, right. but is never recognized as being legitimate by people within the country? How does that play out? Let me, let me, let me pick on a couple of different points that you made there, which I think are, which I think are very, very interesting. First, even though I just said in answer to the previous question that things were so unexpected, if you actually looked very closely as to what was happening in the region in the years leading up to it, it wasn't all that surprising. I mean, you know, what in, in Egypt, there was a decade of protest leading up to uh, leading up to Tahrir Square. It, it, and that, that decade of protest actually began with the Second Intifada. And then there were huge protests against the U.S. invasion of Iraq that quickly turned into anti-Mubarak protests. Mm -hmm. Asia, 
again, a fearsome national security state, one of the most fearsome national security states in the region. It's just a backwater to U.S. foreign policy, so we never really thought about it. There were protests in 2008, big, big protests that were in 2008. And so I think the, the, the point here is that no one, and, and, and the point carries over to Syria, is that these uprisings and revolutions, even though I don't think these were revolutions, are by their very nature unpredictable. And that's why I, I make a big deal actually in False Dawn, and I commend to every time I do a talk like this, a, an article that became a book by a guy named Timur Kuran, who is a professor at Duke University. And he wrote an article about the revolutions in Eastern Europe called Now Out of Never. And it was a theory not of not predicting revolutions, but a theory of the unpredictability of revolution. So Syria is the is the archetypal example of this, if that's the way to pronounce that word. And I, I don't know. Um, for all of my education, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Um, and, and that is to say that, yeah, in Egypt, you could you could see uh, Egypt, you know, one of the points of my book, the, the struggle for Egypt, is that Egyptians have been in revolt against the people who ruled them for 150 years. Syria, you don't really have that. You have coups and counter coups and so on and so forth. But the point is, is that given the opportunity, uprisings come seemingly from nowhere. And in Syria, and you don't know what they are. In Syria, a protest, young boys protesting Bashar al-Assad because they heard about protests elsewhere, turned into something much bigger. People suddenly began to believe that the costs of protesting were not as great as not protesting. And they went out into the streets and then we're off and running into this, into this situation that has led to this very unfortunate conflict in, in Syria. Now, Joanna's question, like, what happens if Bashar al-Assad wins? Now, we have gone, we have oscillated. Bashar al-Assad will fall. It's only a matter of time. Bashar al-Assad is going to lose on the battlefield. Oh, Bashar al-Assad seems to be winning on the battlefield. It's only a matter of time before Bashar al-Assad and the Russians prevail on the battlefield. Oh, we're in a stalemate. I still think it's possible that Bashar al-Assad will lose, but not lose in the way in which we think. Look at what's happened to Syria and Assad. Little Lebanon is the economic lifeboat of Syria. Everything runs through Lebanon. Lebanon has collapsed. Lebanon is a failed state, an absolute failed state. There's no money. It is broke. And this is having a massive impact on Syria and the ability of Bashar al-Assad to continue to grease the wheels of those people who continue to support him or those who believed that they would benefit mightily in a post-war situation. It may not be that he's defeated on the battlefield. It may be that he's consumed by the contradictions and problems associated with carrying on this conflict and the, and, and, and the fact that Syria is so dependent upon its neighbor that has gone economically, uh, economically uh, belly up. But let's say he, he does win. I'm not even sure what that means. I'm not even sure how we think about Syria. If he wins, he wins in a way in which, first of all, for the most part, he's an international pariah, although you would be surprised at how many countries continue to have diplomatic relations with Syria. It's not just Russia and Iran. It's the UAE, it's Egypt, it's Oman, it's Algeria. There's a variety of countries that still have maintained diplomatic relations with Syria. But it is a country that is deeply fractured. It is a country that is permanently occupied by its northern neighbor, Turkey. Turkey has in invaded. It's not just a security belt. Turkey is extending its rule into the northern part of the country to prevent the emergence of a Kurdish state. Uh, it also seems that it's unlikely at this point that the Syrian regime forces and the Russians will be able to retake this area of the country called the Idlib with 3 million people in it. So it would be a fractured, deeply illegitimate, internationally mostly isolated, uh, mostly isolated power. All that being said, I do think that given our experiences in the region over the course of the last however many years, we should expect the possibility that he does prevail in some way. And then what do we do? Very little thinking, very little thinking has been done uh, on that. And I actually teased someone who's now a fairly senior official in the US government that 
Um, it may very well be by the end of either a first or a second Biden administration that that person will be appointed special envoy to the Assad regime. I was just kidding, but that it, it was a certain level of, hey, think about this because that could happen. And so much of that will, I think, depend on what our relationship with Turkey, Iran, and Russia is, and what role they are playing in the world and in Syria. It, this is not just a bilateral question between the United States and Syria. That's exactly right. It, it, it's spot on because Syria is the launch point in the Middle East for which the Russians have sought to weaken not just Europe and the West by encouraging the flow of refugees in that direction, but also by building relations with a variety of America's strategic partners in the region. Russia doesn't have to flip Egypt or Turkey or any other country in the region like the United States flipped Egypt in the 1970s. It just needs to pull them a little bit away from the United States that creates dynamics in the region as well as in Europe that are unfavorable to uh, the United States and its coalition in the region and has a bearing on what will ultimately happen and who's willing to accommodate what in Syria going forward. That's a very, very good point. So I'm going to try and, and bring a couple of questions into one broader one. Um, the United States- Should I grab a pen? You said a couple of questions in one broader one. Maybe I should do that. Hold okay. On. Go ahead. Just reaching for paper. The United States has, has become particularly heavily involved on security issues in the Middle East over the last couple of decades. Not that it wasn't security before, not that there aren't lots of other aspects to the relationship, but counterterrorism has been a big one. And many of the countries that are strengthening their autocratic holds are do, say that they are doing it to defend against Islamists. Um, you know, not, not even terrorists, but, you know, Islamists writ large. So my question on this is, have, have we created a monster by encouraging countries to think in terms of being counterterrorism partners to the United States? So that's part of it. The other is where countries have been able to sort of push back or hold off the uprisings in the first place by providing funds. A lot of those countries, Gulf monarchies, for example, are, are a bit cash strapped. And they are also among those who claim that they are, are exerting more repression because of the Muslim Brotherhood. So the UAE, Saudi Arabia, very, very strong against the Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, CC is quite happy with that. So given this whole melange of Islamism, counterterrorism, the particular countries that are working on it and their own problems, how does this play out? Take that any direction you want. Okay. To answer your first question, have we created monsters? Yes, we have. I mean, and, and you know, uh, the it was so abundantly clear to me not that long after the attacks on New York and Washington that we had created monsters because you would go to the region and you would talk to Egyptian officials and they'd say, well, we're writing our own Patriot Act, our own counterterrorism law. You're either with us or against us when it comes to when it comes to fighting terrorism. Uh, and these are these people are terrorists. You Americans are crazy. And look at your double standards. So, of course, we have. And we've become trapped in that. Not only have we become trapped in that in our foreign policy, which uh, has become over securitized. I don't think I have to talk to a former foreign service officer and child of former foreign, of foreign service officers to convince you of that. But I think it's abundantly clear we've over securitized our foreign policy. Um, it, I think to the detriment of our foreign relations, because we have become 
it's become a, in many ways, it has become about counterterrorism. And we essentially handed an excuse for first Mubarak, then Abu Tassisi, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Emiratis, the Saudis, whoever, whatever bad guys you want to, you, you want to point out to say, to write counterterrorism laws that can be interpreted as broadly as they possibly can be to ensnare as many political opponents as possible. So I always say to my friends in the Egyptian government, I was like, you guys are really stupid. No one would have cared if you rounded up every last member of the Muslim Brotherhood. But then again, you went ahead and arrested everybody else and called them terrorists when they clearly weren't terrorists. So, I mean, what does Adaf Suwaif's family have to do with terrorism? I mean, these are, these are kind of crazy things, especially when a country like Egypt actually has a genuine security problem. It is fighting a branch of the Islamic State in the Sinai Peninsula. So it, it both provides a, a, a it, it gives, it encourages this kind of authoritarianism and it de diminishes their ability to actually focus on what is truly the threat. Now, on this question of, you know, the major Gulf states who have funded counter-revolution around the region, I mean, essentially the Emiratis and, and, the, and the Saudis refloated the Egyptian economy to give Abdel Fassisi a running start. They didn't create the coup, but they certainly helped make sure it was going to be, uh, was going to be successful. And what happens in their own societies? I think in the Emirates, this is less of a problem. It's much, much smaller uh, than in other, uh, than a place like Saudi Arabia, for example. But, and, and Saudi Arabia certainly is a wealthy but poor country. And there are a, a variety of destabilizing factors that are, uh, that are, are underway in Saudi Arabia, namely uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's uh, Vision 2030 is deeply destabilizing. Because what it does is it, it tends to change the way in which politics and business is done in Saudi Arabia. Totally different way of doing things from which they've been done. That is destabilizing. Um, it, it, Saudi Arabia's economy is irrational, but its political economy is entirely rational. And he's trying to undermine that. What I always say about MBS is that actually he's Gamal Mubarak, but he actually has money to do it. At a level of abstraction, what Kamal Babar tried to do in Egypt, which under the guise of modernization, I don't even remember what they called it, but they called it something fancy like Vision 2030, but not Vision 2030. And what it did was it was, it was destabilizing. And it was one of those things that contributed to that moment in 2011. Now, I think the place where I want to pick on your question, Joanne, is this. And I think people think about it in these terms as well, that these... These countries basically buy political quiescence because they're so fabulously wealthy. And, I, and, and I've engaged in this as well. I once, I once wrote a piece about Qatar saying that Qatar was a place without, without politics because everybody got a check for $160,000 at the end of the fiscal year. And so like everybody was happy because if you define politics as the competition over the control and distribution of resources, Everybody has a lot of resources, so they're all pretty happy. Yes, but I think resources and being able to buy political guessings is really only one component. And maybe it works in Qatar because it's this tiny little place, but it doesn't necessarily own work in places like Saudi Arabia, where, like I said, a wealthy but poor country. And I think that the three things that you, people really need to look at in terms of leadership and this question of stability or instability, or I like to think about it in relative instability is one, positive vision of the future. What is, what is the heroic narrative? I mean, at the positive vision of the future here in the United States is the American dream. You work hard, you can achieve anything. Uh, second is bribery. What you're talking about. How much can you spread around to buy political quiescence. And the third is coercion. All countries have some mix of it. It strikes me that the ones that are kind of overweighted on positive vision generally do better. Like on, on April 15th, which is coming up, right? On April 15th, 
it doesn't make me happy to write a check to the U.S. government, but yeah, it's a pretty good place. I'm willing to do it. I like it. I worked hard. I was able to achieve something and so on and so forth. The American dream is a lot. You don't really have that in the Gulf. I mean, Husni Mubarak had that problem in Egypt. He had not a lot of vision, right? Um, how could you have a country with a guy who's in his 80s saying he's shepherding the crossing to the future and he didn't have areas and he didn't have m- enough money to spread around to enough people because it's a huge country and he had to rely a lot on coercion and you got to a point where people were not as afraid as they once were and it overwhelmed him. I still think that in Saudi Arabia, someone like Mohammed bin Salman actually does have a vision for the future that a lot of people buy into. I mean, it, Mohammed bin Salman is not someone who I want to hang out with. Um, he's done some pretty terrible things. But in Saudi Arabia, he's been very shrewd in building a reservoir of public support, mostly people from his age cohort, from 18 to 35, who wa- are plugged into the world and want to live more like the world. Not all of them are poets or journalists or whoever. They want to go to WWE. They want to go to the movies. They want to go sit with their girlfriends. They want to have publicly have girlfriends and sit in restaurants. He's let, he's let women drive. That is not just a public relations thing. It is something that actually makes a lot of sense economically for women in Saudi Arabia. This has created a reservoir of public support for him in the event he runs into trouble. So he does have a positive vision of the future. He does have an ability to buy enough people. And of course, in Saudi Arabia, there's a significant amount of coercion. I can make the same argument about the UAE, which is not a democracy, but you consistently see Emiratis saying how much they like what's going on in, 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 the, in the Emirates. And, like, and the Emirati leaders are like, we're the benevolent monarchy. Look how wonderful things are here. We've given people, you know, lots of infrastructure and this kind of playland of Dubai and it all works and we're tolerant and we're different and so on and so forth. And people have bought into it. Of course, if you step out of line in the UAE, you're going to disappear in jail as well. So it does have right. that vision. It's got the money and it's got the coercion. It's the question of the balance of all of them. If you have a lot of vision, you don't need as much as the other ones. And those are the countries that are relatively more stable or relatively less unstable than before. I would put, you know, UAE and Saudi Arabia still in that category where the leaders still have something. It's not all coercion. It's not all bribery. So it's, it's interesting in Saudi Arabia right now, because, (laughs) you know, we, we, We tend to think of Saudi Arabia, people often think of Saudi Arabia as being like, well, it's in the Middle East, so it's been a country for a long time. And of course, it hasn't. But the the royal family, you know, it doesn't have the descended from the prophet thing that Morocco and Jordan does. It does have the, we, we have a right to be here because we are linked to pure Islam. You know, it has the link to Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And even when people don't like that, they recognize that that is a kind of legitimacy, right? And that enabled the royal family to sort of say, we, d- we don't need your other flavors. We've got ours. Now, right. you have MBS. I agree that that people who just want some flash in their lives. And God knows I understand that. They respond to it. But that same group responded to Bashar when he started opening things up and when he brought in the internet and let people travel and study abroad. You know, and it didn't take very long before people said, yeah, but you're not letting us actually have the openness that goes along with that. He didn't have the money. But my question with MBS is whether he, when there is a questioning of him, does he have, has he sacrificed the royal family's legitimacy, the sense that they are linked to all the other families in the kingdom and that you can show up and present a petition and all this stuff that, 
you know, is is in people's memories. It does is there enough resonance of legitimacy in what he is trying to do? Or do we just look at it and say, yeah, that makes sense. He's modernizing. I, I, I think it's the gazillion dollar question here. You know, what what do we know about what's going on in, in Saudi Arabia? It's, it's very, very hard to see, you know, what's happening within the royal court. And it's very hard to understand where Saudi public opinion is, other than the fact that we know that a certain age cohort likes to be plugged in. And you make a very good point, although I would be, makes me a little nervous to compare Syria and Saudi Arabia. But of course, you know, MBS is going to have to deliver and continue to deliver. Two things on this sources of legitimacy. I'm not sure that the source of legitimacy was Wahhabism, although that was obviously important. There was this deal between the clerical establishment, but it was that Saudi kings are the custodians of the two holy places and oil well. Those are kind of the twin mm -hmm. pillars uh, of, of these things. There's nothing written, and, and, and MBS is sort of, he's put the, the religious establishment in its place. He's undermined the religious police, which is wildly, wildly popular. Why? Yeah. If he had just done that, right? Uh, people would have been super excited. Believe me, my Saudi friends, really excited about that. Um, but what's to say if he gets in trouble that he doesn't pivot back and emphasize religion again? I mean, they, they've taken religion. They've said, since 19, this is all, this is Saudi official narrative. It's not true. I mean, if you talk to the Saudi official narrative, Saudi Arabia has been around since the 17th century. Not true. You know, the first Saudi state, whatever. Right. We know it, 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 it's actually not the case. Official Saudi narrative is that, you know, extremist Islam only reared its head in 1979 and coincided with the Iranian revolution. Hmm, isn't that self-serving? In any event, what they've been saying is, is that we're the face of moderate Islam and the World Muslim League leader is out there meeting with rabbis and Christian leaders everywhere and so on and so forth and moderate, 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 moderate. That may resonate, but there may be a point where he can resurrect the religious establishment to advance his parochial interests as he battles it out with other members of the royal family. Or it just ends up kind of the way it is now. He's not, a he's not a liberalizer, but he's a reformer. He, and, and Saudi Arabia is kind of like what you get under, uh, what you have now is kind of like what you're going to get under MBS. This is that top-down reform. People will like it for the most part. And you will kind of muddle through. And we're going to have to decide, though, whether our investment in Saudi Arabia continues to be worth it and mm -hmm. whether that's okay with us. So I'm going to pivot since we talked about religion just a little bit. There's a lot of reference right now to Sunni governments in the Gulf, but elsewhere being very concerned about Iran, uh, Iranian efforts at hegemony or at creating proxies, all the rest of it. But at the same time, one of the coherent threads through most of the uprisings and the fall of 2019 protests in Iraq and Lebanon was anti-sectarianism, was not just we are all out here together, but we actively reject the exploitation of religious and sectarian differences by these elites to manipulate us. Isn't that, so, isn't that amazing? Yeah. It, it's, it, it, it was like, <laughs> that was, that has really been one of the most fascinating things to see that has happened is that people have rejected. And you, you actually saw it after the invasion of Iraq where Sunni and Shia in Baghdad wrote, what's everybody talking about here? I'm yeah. married to Sunni, I'm married to, we call ourselves sushi. I mean, you know, it's absurd. Yeah. So, and people are rejecting this because they see this as the manipulation of elites. I'm sorry, I interrupted you though, because it was, it's such a fascinating thing that's going on. 
Well, really, I, I was just coming to the end, and, and I totally agree with your reaction there. But at the same time, there's a heightening of, of uh, hostile, derogatory, sectarian language. I mean, when I, when I first went to, to Yemen, people didn't talk about it. Two years later, you know, there was all this, well, I'm not going to repeat them here, but really nasty terms flying both ways. And of course, now we see what there is. So how do we tie together this groundswell of we really don't like the sectarianization of domestic and foreign policy with what we're hearing is everybody's against the Iranians because they're Shia. Right. It's, you know, the, the really the epicenter for this is actually Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, you know, you see in Saudi Arabia both the uh, kind of emergence of this nationalism, but alongside of it, the continued kind of delegitimization of the Shia branch of Islam. And you've heard MBS saying, you, you, you can't possibly expect us to negotiate with the Jaffries, the Shia. So it's, what I think you're hitting on something, and I think protesters are hitting on something, is that what Saudis and other leaders in the region have sought to do is to leverage sectarianism to advance their agendas in what is essentially a power struggle between big countries over who gets to write the rules of the road in the region. That's mm -hmm. been a perennial problem between Iran and its neighbors in the Gulf before the Islamic Revolution and afterwards. So this is really about power politics, not about sectarianism. However, however, leaders seeing political advantage in doing that have injected the, the issue of sectarianism in it, which unfortunately makes it harder to resolve these conflicts because then the question of identity is engaged. And, and God. And, right, right. Your, your identity as a, as a, a Sunni, a Shia, whatever, is engaged and that makes it extremely, extremely difficult to resolve these conflicts because they are on a different level. Whereas you can imagine a conflict between powers, you know, regional powers over name the issue, islands in the Gulf or whatever, you can imagine a resolution to those problems. How is it possible to resolve a conflict between people who you think are be deeply beneath you. Mm. You know, I, I'd rather proclaim my Judaism in Riyadh, especially now, than if I was a Shia. Like <laughs> Jews are kind of popular. Yeah. Jews are kind of popular in the Middle East these days. Um, it's it's a very weird feeling. But the the, the 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 fact of the matter is, is that it makes it that much more difficult on that on that level uh, of identity. Now, you point out the good news: Iraqis are like, we're not having this. Lebanese. We're not having this. This is the kind of thing that doesn't really resonate that much in a place like Egypt. If they don't, you know, they, they play the Iran game because they want to be on side with the Saudis and the Emiratis, even though they're not really on side with the Saudis and the Emiratis. That's why they're tight with Bashar al-Assad. But it's really something that has become messages that countries in the region, people in the region have been confronted with for two decades. And it's become embedded in the political discourse there, which makes it really hard to imagine any kind of, you know, when people talk about, oh, there's going to be a grand bargain between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Not really sure about it, even if people want it. And that's the tragedy. I mean, that's, pol that's politics, right? Leaders often do things that are in their own interest that are a suboptimal outcome for everybody else. Uh Tempted as I am to follow that up with a question about normalization between UAE and Israel, I'm not going to go there. Uh, but there are a couple of questions that I think are, are interesting because it has to do with the relationship of the United States and the Middle East. So one of them is, is should we read anything into the fact that MBS is one of the very few or only uh, leaders in the Middle East that hasn't had education in the West. And also, what would the Middle East look like if the UA, if the United States had not gotten involved, except possibly recognizing Israel? 
Well, since we have eight minutes left, those are fantastic questions, Joanna. I, I'm going to have to slither out of them. No, let me um, let me start with the the first one. Um, first of all, did anybody ever did anybody have their money on Prince Salman, the governor of Riyadh, of being the king of Saudi Arabia? I mean, so nobody really ever expected that MBS would be in this position, although. Salman's other sons have been educated in the West. Mm -hmm. I think the education in the West thing is kind of overrated. I mean, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, I'm very proud of my education, but I thought I was, couldn't have gotten a better education had I gone to another country and so on and so forth. But, but there's Bashar. Well, exactly. Or, or Abdul Sisi. Have you read his <laughs> master's thesis at the Army War College? It's just a massive conspiracy theory rip on American foreign policy in the region. I mean, there's doesn't seem to me to be a connection between being educated in the West and being enlightened. That's mm -hmm. all, right. Uh, even every DC politician's favorite Middle Eastern leader, King Abdullah II of Jordan, is not the kind of reformer, progressive, forward-leaning leader that they imagine in their head. So um, it, it, it strikes me that it's it's a wash. Uh, there are people who have been educated in the West who are uh, reactionary and bloodthirsty and terrible. And there are people who haven't been educated in the West who are enlightened. I, I, I actually think it's a, it, it's, it's a wash. Um, what if the United States had not, it, it's it, it, extraordinary counterfactual, um, but what's interesting that you ask it, and you, I did not set you up to ask it, is that I'm writing a book right now called The End of Ambition, America's Past, Present, Future in This. And I've just gone through this kind of torturous, um, too long, too torturous discussion of national interests and where they come from and how they become national interests. And, and I, 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 you all have to read the book. And I promise you when it comes out in the final form, it won't be torturous. It'll be, <laughs> it'll be entertaining, I promise. Um, but what I do think, and this is sort of the kernel of, of the book, is that we are in this moment where there's so much debate about whether we should be in the region and we ending endless wars, withdrawing from the region, retrenchment, whatever these things mean is that there is actually a way to be in the Middle East without being crazily overextended and deeply securitized and wrapped around the axle of politics in the region. And that is smart, that looks after our interests, that is not securitized, and that is constructive. You know, we keep worrying about, oh, the Chinese and the Russians in the Middle East. If we stop doing really stupid things, we actually wouldn't have to really worry that much about the Chinese uh, and the Russians. A lot of this stuff is our own goal because we lost sight of what was actually important to the United States in the Middle East. And one of those things is Israel, but Israel is not going to be as important going forward. Look, I wrote a piece in my regular foreign policy column, I guess it was last May, maybe it was in that pandemic. I have absolutely no idea what year it is, what day it is. I was convinced it was Friday and this meeting had happened yesterday when I woke up this morning. But point that it's not written anywhere that we need to have the special relationship where we are funding Israel's defense industry in perpetuity. So there is change. Is Saudi Arabia as important to us as it once was? I can make a perfectly cogent, wonky argument about global oil markets. But at the same time, my kids are never going to drive a car that runs on gas. Uh, that there is a kind of deeply appealing political objective in this country, which is to be energy independent. I don't have to tell people in Texas how important that is to certain people. It's a, but it's, I don't even think it's possible, but it's politically potent. And when things are politically potent, politicians generally respond to them, whether they're leading that political potency or they're sensing that they could gain advantage from it. And, mm -hmm. what, and what has been the messaging about that over all of these years is that if we are energy independent, if we drill baby drill, we don't have to be in the Middle East anymore. And I don't know, I've been, before the pandemic, anytime I gave a talk anywhere in the United States and I asked for a show of hands, how many people want to do more in the Middle East? No one raised their hand. I think one person in San Antonio might have. 
but you guys have to work that out in Texas. Um, it, it strikes me though, that if we had an idea of what was important in the Middle East, Americans would say, that makes sense. They wouldn't be saying we have to get out, we have to get out or regime change, regime change. It's not a choice between those two things. We can be constructive, normal actor in the region, even with our tremendous power. Um, Liz, do you want to wrap things up on that? Because I can't think of anything I can say that's going to make it any better than that. Well, you two are a wealth of information. And Stephen, really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much. Joanne, you were the perfect moderator to uh, join in discussion. And Stephen, you're humorous as well. So that was a nice touch. I think one of the important <laughs> things in this world is, especially for people who live in the DC area and Liz, you used to live in the DC area, is not to take yourself too seriously. There's, <laughs> there's too many people who do take themselves too heresy, seriously. Heresy, heresy. <laughs> All over the well, just to close this out, for any past programs, you can catch us on YouTube on our channel. You can look at our website for upcoming pro programs. And if you're not a member of our council yet, please do join us. I would love to meet you in person when it's safe to do so. And uh, anyway, you can see more about membership on our website as well, dfwworld.org. You two, thank you again. This was a true pleasure. This it was, was my pleasure. Timing. I look forward to seeing you all in Dallas sometime soon. We, we would love to host you. Thanks to you both and have a good evening. Thanks have for joining night. us. Thank you. Thank you.